Welcome to the Susan Sly Project, where entrepreneurs rule, startups launch, and the side hustle becomes the main hustle. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Susan Sly. Well, hey, what is up, side hustlers? I have a question for you. The podcast industry is a billion dollar industry and growing. People can start a podcast in a matter of minutes. And in fact, it is one of the top ways to build your brand. If you heard my interview with Tom Ziegler, who is the son of the legend himself, Zig Ziegler, he said the number one lead magnet they have at Ziegler right now is their podcast. So if you've ever wanted to learn how to start a podcast, grow a podcast, build a brand, then this is the episode for you. And if you're sitting on the fence going, I don't know if I want to have a podcast, well, after this, you probably will. So with that, I before I bring out the guest, I want to just share a couple of quick announcements. Number one, if you want to be coached by me, a certified coach, a mom of five, a multimillionaire, then head over to SusanSly.com, get on the list because I do live coaching for my listeners, private live coaching once a month. And that's how you get your invitation. So go to SusanSly.com. We have our event, The Ultimate Marketing Experience coming up September 25th and 26th. And so our keynote speaker is none other than Upgrade Your Life himself, Mr. Dave Asprey. Dave, of course, is the author of three and soon to be four New York Times bestsellers. He had a Silicon Valley exit for $600 million, so that's not too bad. And on top of it, he's the creator of the Bulletproof brand. We have Jeffrey from JR Garage. If you saw that episode, he has done over 200,000 transactions on eBay. He has one of the top YouTube channels. He is monetizing like crazy, owns 22 luxury cars and an airplane. He just got himself an airplane hanger and he's 20 years old. Casey Adams is the top podcaster for Gen Z. He has his show, Rise of the Young. He's going to be teaching you. We have Kieran O'Brien, who's going to be teaching on Instagram and Facebook ads and much more. So check it out, umeonline.live. So with that, my guest today is a powerhouse. He is the creator and founder of the Create Your Own Life podcast, which studies the highest performers in the world. He said literature, get this at Oxford University, so super geeky, is a man after my own heart. Like, I'm such a geek. You guys know it. I'm nerdy to the end of the earth. He specializes in using podcasting and new media to create celebrity and was ranked number one in iTunes new and number 78 in iTunes top 100, which is not easy to do, believe me. He was named the number one podcast to listen to by Inc. Magazine in 2019 and a top influencer by Forbes. And after his success in podcasting, he and his beautiful wife, Brielle, found a command your brand to help entrepreneurs, just like all of you, get their message out by appearing as guests on podcasts. So with that, Jeremy Slate, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Hey, Susan. It is awesome to be here. I'm, I'm stoked to get a chance to chat and also share some value with your audience today. Okay, okay let's, let's, let's just let's jump, just out, jump of out of the gate. So, so we've got, we've a, got lot a lot of crazy, crazy going, going, going on, on in the world, world and a lot of uncertainty. I ask mm-hmm. all of my guests this very same question. Why is now a great time to start a business? Well, especially if you're going to go online, there's so much opportunity if you can figure out how to pivot Um, Because I've even seen a lot of traditional business owners, like one of my friends owns a weight loss office in New Jersey. And like with so much stuff being closed, I helped them to pivot their business online. And now they're seeing more patients every day online and virtually than they were even seeing in their office. So I think there's a ton of opportunity if you could figure out how to make a great experience for your clients and people, you know, in your business since things have shifted so much. So it's a really awesome opportunity if you could figure out how to do things online right now. What would you say? To, I love that answer. And, and, you know, figuring out how to do things online, pivot. What do you say to the person who, if we look at generations, so we've got Gen Z, they kind of popped out of the womb and were given an iPad, right? Yeah. Or, you know, like it's a whole different generation. <laughs> Some of my kids are in that generation. Then you have millennials who start to get technology, you know, early on. And then there's Gen X who were newer adopters. And then there's boomers who are looking at this encore career and going, I didn't grow up with technology. I'm intimidated. What would you say to someone who is intimidated by technology? Well, I'd say it's just a growth mindset thing. Like, you know, because there, there's nothing that ever stays the same, either living or you're dying and whichever way you want to look at it. So it's just kind of deciding to grow. Cause for myself, like, you know, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties. So I guess I'm considered a millennial. Like we didn't have a computer on the internet until I was in high school, like my freshman year of high school. And I remember my mom was a beautician and one of her, uh, clients who since passed on because she'd be about 90 now was somebody that always had the newest computer, always had the newest thing, always knew how to use it. If we had a tech problem, we'd call her. So I think it's, it's really a decision to kind of tackle it, look at it and confront it. I, I think just deciding like, 
the internet's going away is kind of a ridiculous viewpoint at this point in time. So you just have to kind of see this is how things are changing. This is where we're going. How can I understand it? What comfort level with it can I do? Because, you know, you don't have to do everything online. I know some people still want to run by a, a paper appointment book. My wife still does, and that's totally fine. So you want to figure out what your comfort level is with that, but you have to have a growth mindset around it. I love it. Tackle it, look at it, confront it. Now, yeah. Brielle and I are soul sisters. So I always, <laughs> when, I, when I wrote my best-selling book, Organize Your Life, here's why I always recommend a paper planner. It's because of the IRS or whatever your like tax authority is. The show is mm -hmm. like in 114 countries right now. And if you get audited, your paper planner stands up. And so tell your wife, Brielle, gold star. Like totally, she, she's rocking it. I, I always say she's the smarter one out of the two. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just the face they put on things. She actually makes everything work. <laughs> You're pretty smart yourself. I mean, Oxford University, how did that happen? How did you go from Oxford to podcasting? I mean, you know, how, tell me about that. So I'm like a, a super nerd. Like I've been a competitive powerlifter since my like, you know, I guess the end of my teenage years until, you know, my late twenties and like around 30, I was kind of like, this probably isn't a good idea anymore. So I was kind of had that like in the, in the whole, you know, like scheme of things on the back up, back end. But at the same time, I've always been a super nerd. Like things have always interested me. I've always liked to study. Um, I wouldn't recommend anybody do their college experience like me because you kind of get out and you're like, what do people hire you for? I don't know. So like I have an undergrad degree in Catholic theology and Torah. I'm a double major. So I studied religion. I think it's really interesting. Then um, my grades were so good that my school, Seton Hall University, actually paid for me to do a program at Oxford uh, where I studied uh, literature of J.R.R. Tolkien. I studied C.S. Lewis. I studied Chesterton, stuff like that. Um, I actually got a chance to become really close friends with uh, Walter Hooper, who's the gentleman that runs C.S. Lewis's estate. So I got to go to Lewis's house and stuff, which is very cool. Um, and then I came back and did my master's degree. And um, Seton Hall didn't have a classics department, which is, which is where I went to school anymore in their master's department. Like they had it in their undergrad, but you couldn't do it in graduate school. So I wrote up a whole program of like what I was going to do that got approved. And basically I did an ancient history masters and uh, my area of study is not like something you come out and get a job in. Like my, my, I actually studied how the Roman emperor convinced uh, the regular people he was God and the, and the actual program he used to do it. So I like to say, I study early Roman empire propaganda, not a very marketable skill in the world of getting a job. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's so I mean, we could do a whole show on Catholic theology at Torah, right? Yeah. And um, I know your friends with Dennis, you Dennis is like my brother. And you know, Dennis went to London School of Economics. And, and our listeners know, unless this is your first show, welcome, um, that I'm currently studying at MIT. Oh, awesome. And, and I think there's some there's I want to ask you about this. It's, mm -hmm. it's I'm just so curious. So there is this whole group of people who says, you don't need higher education, just go to YouTube University. Yeah. And then you, you know, Seton Hall, Oxford, you know, Dennis, London School of Economics. What is your thought on that? Well, I, I tend to tend to look at there's something missing in our in our world. And it's something that Dennis is really big on. And, you know, it's the idea of apprenticeships, like working under somebody that's in a certain area of life. Because like, if you look at like it's only been the last, I guess, 100 years since the Industrial Revolution, well, 150 years since the Industrial Revolution that, you know, like we go to school the way we do, especially since the 50s. Like it, before that, it was a lot different. Like if you wanted to be, you know, a plumber, you work with a plumber for a few years, you learn the craft and you either decided if you wanted to do it or, you know, you moved on. And I think that's the really big thing that's missing is at 17 or 18 years old, you're asking kids to commit to a lifetime of a career that may not even exist when they're out of school um, because a lot of the school training is really behind. So I think the big thing missing is some sort of apprenticeships, which I know Dennis is really big on putting that back out in the world. So I'll say that's important. I don't think everybody needs to go to college anymore. I, I do think there are some certain careers that you need to do that for like I don't want anybody operating on me that hasn't you know got their medical degree and their residency and all that kind of stuff um, I especially don't want them operating on me if they've been on the show Grey's Anatomy because everything seems to go wrong on that show um, but at this but at the same time there's also things you have to look at like Ivy League schools are still very important because it's also a card that's going to get you access to a lot of other things right it's an access thing more about the degree whereas like oxford it's an access thing london school of economics it's an access and notoriety thing so like certain areas of that it's still really really important but i don't think everybody needs to go to college anymore 
because the, the problem we're now running into, and at least this is, you know, I graduated in 2011 from grad school. So the problem I see, at least from people in my graduating class, is you get out of school. Uh, so I graduated in 2009 for undergrad, 2011 for, for master's. You get out of school and everybody has a college degree. You're like, okay, so what do I do? I guess I get a master's that puts me ahead. So now you got even more debt and you got even more, even less experience because you're going to school even longer. So I think we're, it's this self-perpetuating problem unless we find out a way to put some sort of apprenticeship in there where they decide, mm. okay, do I want to go to a technical school? Do I want to go to a university? Do I need to? So I think it's something really missing. In the UK, they, they do the gap year. And mm -hmm. that's that whole year where you're kind of not just figuring out yourself, but you're, you are apprenticing. And, I, and to your point, my undergrad degree, I wanted to be a surgeon. And I, oh, you cool. know, that, that, yeah, which was super cool. But then I ended up being a research assistant with criminology and started coding like early facial recognition and stuff like that. And it's, I think, you know, more than anything, I spent so many, you know, years in sales. Was I using my degree? Not necessarily, but the critical thinking, yeah. the empir empirical thinking, the scientific method, and now studying AI at MIT, I'm like, thank God I went to university because I don't, you know, I, I watch a lot of YouTube videos too, but I'm, I, it's, there's something different when you're in an environment, you're immersed, you have a professor telling you, you have to understand this and you're going to get graded on it versus you can shut off the YouTube video anytime. Yeah. Well, and I think the thing that's interesting too, like at least from my viewpoint is like, had I not went to grad school and, went and done other stuff, I wouldn't be doing a lot of what I'm doing now. Like I can turn out a, you know, 20 to 50 page paper, like nobody's business because I learned how to do that in school. You know, my, my graduate thesis, uh, you know, was over a hundred pages. It took me a while to write it, but like you kind of learn how to, to be able to coherently put out an argument in a different way. And also one of the really good things is I've learned how to do internet research like you know, nobody's business. And that's something that's very, very applicable in every single thing that I've done. So I, I think for me, that experience has been super, super, you know, good at the same time. It's also given me the, the ability to talk to a lot of different people and have reality on what they think and what they know and how they operate because I've experienced that stuff. Absolutely. Well, the, the fact you can churn out that paper is impressive. I'm writing a, <laughs> I'm writing a blog, you know, right now on AI and healthcare, you know, mm -hmm. and referencing like Alan Turing, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, maybe Jeremy will have an offline discussion about that. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, uh, in 2010, it was the year I, the year I started dating my wife and, uh, the night we met, um, I was writing a paper on all three parts of Dante's divine comedy. And I turned out a 27 page paper, um, in a single night without any notes and somehow got a 97 on the paper. So go figure. <laughs> nice. Nice. And something I want everyone to think about as we, as we shift gears at Podcast. If you guys are, are lovers and lovers of the show, you'll know, like, even when I have like a Dave Asprey here or a Jesse Itzler, whoever it is that is on the show, we're obviously going to veer off and talk about tech or life or something. And, and the person behind the company, the person, the on the person behind that badge of entrepreneurship and, and Jeremy thinking about that level of due diligence or critical thinking that you have that it just mm -hmm. is ingrained in you. Let's talk about podcasting. So there are, there are a lot of people, let's say three camps. So there are people who are dabblers. They are like, oh, I'm going to do a podcast. They put out three episodes and then they disappear. I, call them, the, the I call them the magical internet money people, but continue. <laughs> magical internet money people. Yes. <laughs> I see like sparkly little gnomes or something. Um, then there are the people who you know, the, the next level of person. And, and I was there, you know, I used to do radio. I put out a show once in a while just because I really just want to help people. And then there are the pros. Mm -hmm. Let's start at the beginning. Why should someone consider podcasting and how do they even get started? Well, I'll just say, first off, don't be the magical internet money person. And I actually get that from, this is just showing my age, but I got this from a, from a South Park episode 15 years ago now at this point where this is when YouTube first kind of became popular and they all thought they were going to make money by being on YouTube and they found out that they didn't make any money. But there's a lot of people that start a podcast for that reason, right? They see Joe Rogan, they see all these shows and they're like, oh, I'm going to start a podcast. Everybody's going to listen to it and I'm going to make so much money from advertising. And there's like 1% or one half of 1% that are really going to like do that with advertising. It's just, it's just not what most people are going to do. So the, the, the thing you should be looking at when you do a podcast is number one, what is the reason I'm doing this? 
I don't think a podcast is a business in itself for, as I said, you know, 99.9, you know, 99.5% of people or whatever it is. But I think I look at it as your PR vehicle or your storefront for what you're already doing. So like maybe you are um, an author that has some coaching products or maybe you have a fully, you know, staff business where you're doing all different things and you're looking to get the right positioning. So what it can help you do is to differentiate from people in your sphere because you're getting your message out there using an incredible networking tool. Cause you mentioned Dave Asprey, like connecting with people like that because you have a show. So it's an incredible networking tool. And at the same time, it helps to, and this is something that, that we're actually helping a brand now do is it helps to personalize your brand because a lot of times people see a brand and it's a big kind of faceless thing, but when they can put a person to it, they can connect with it and communicate it and talk and talk to it. So that, that's really what you should be looking at. If, if you aren't giving a different message than anybody out there, if they're, if you're thinking that it is a business in itself, then go for it as a hobby. But at the same time, like, I don't think it's really necessary to start. Oh, that is so good, Jeremy. And I love how you broke that down. I mean, the what's the reason you're doing this? I mean, what's the, mm-hmm. I always say to people thinking of starting a business, firstly, why? You know, Simon Sinek, start with why, but why are you doing this? Because yeah. it, the, there's so many people I know who have shows. Mm-hmm. There, there's, there's a passion about it. You know, even if you look like at John Lee Dumas, why did he start Entrepreneur on Fire and become so successful? He's like, I just want to highlight these entrepreneurs you might not hear about. And, and he I was remember, systemized to anything as well. Like he had everything down. I think that's important too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And just this, the 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 why you want to spread a message. And and if you don't know that then, you know, maybe start with putting some videos on YouTube or something. But, you know, once you start to do your show, it's, you're going to start to gain followers and listeners and you'll let these people down if you're not being consistent. So I, that's, that's so huge. And as a networking tool, absolutely key. And then personalizing your brand, which is awesome. All right, let's talk about doing it right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if someone says, you know what, I'm, I'm vested and I'm ready to be consistent. What does consistency look like? What tools do they need to have? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to, I guess, kind of preface this the way I started. And I, when I, I, as I told you, I have a master's degree in ancient history. So I was a very like analytical, dry, hard to read writer early on. And it took me a long time to learn how to write so people can, you know, understand it and enjoy it and whatever it may be. So for me, I was like, I love podcasts. Let me give that a shot because it's talking to people and I can do that. So I had started because my writing was just, you know, too difficult to understand, even though I could do a lot of it. So when you look at somebody's website and they're an expert in some area, they should have something to say, right? They should have an opinion. They should have something that makes them different. So that's the first thing you start is with is what makes me different in my area. And then the next thing you want to take a look at, and this is why I tell people to look at their week like a funnel, meaning that the beginning of the week people come for you or come for the guest and the end of the week they stay for you. So you then want to make a list of, you know, the hundred people that would have the biggest impact to you within that niche and start reaching out to those people. And as a, it's shoot for the stars because you may just, you know, pull some in. And I, I early on had some pretty good luck because I was consistent at that. And then you kind of finish the week with a content piece from yourself. So you want to kind of really position your show for that week because it does a couple things. You get the really good networking, but also good positioning by being seen with the right people. And then you also build your own expertise by maybe having a five or 10 minute episode where you explain something, or maybe it's longer. I know, I know some people that'll take their Friday, their Thursday or Friday episode, and they'll turn it into a free coaching call, which is brilliant because then people see how your coaching works. They get an experience, they get a free coaching call if they come on, so they tell other people about it. So you need to figure out how this is going to fit in your business. And that's kind of the first part. Um, the second part I would say is good branding and good audio is important. Now you don't have to go like super nerdy like me. Like I've only invested in some higher end gear even in the last six months and I've been doing this for five years. So, you know, having a good, uh, like I think Audio Technica ATR 2100 is kind of like the, the standard that everybody can start with and it sounds decent and it's under a hundred bucks. So you, but you do want to have a good quality mic is kind of the first thing to do. Um, and the other thing that a lot of people burn out because is show production is like really, really hard. So the thing that I did early on that really helped me is I was initially editing episodes the way I wanted. So I documented everything, wrote everything up, screen recorded everything. And then I actually went to uh, onlinejobs.ph and I found somebody in the Philippines that could run that process for me. And then, you know, I haven't edited an episode, you know, unless I wanted to, there was one that I did with the most interesting man in the world. Cause I had a certain way I wanted to do it, but I haven't really edited an episode in three years. 
And that, those are the things you have to think of, like, what are going to be the reasons I wouldn't continue doing this? And, and production is a huge one because you started the show to connect with people and learn from people, not to have another job. That's, and I use onlinejobs.phd. Oh, they're awesome. Right? Yeah. You know John as well? I do, actually. I met, I met John through Dennis, and we have a whole team, and shouts out to them. So when we, we do the show, it, it, when the whole COVID thing happened, it was, I, I really sat, Jeremy, and I said, you know, life is different. So what am I passionate about? Where, where do I not want to be spending as much time? Where do I, do, where do I want to be spending time? And if, if my legacy could be three things, you know, what would those be? And because I love radio, because I loved all of it, I got back to that. So I started doing, um, you know, free live coaching every single week. We'd record those. We made those into a show. They're up on YouTube. Um, if, if the sound quality is really great, we'll put them up on iTunes and Spotify. But if it's sketchy, mm -hmm. um, we'll leave it at video because the yeah. video does sound better. And then, you know, we deploy it through channels and we put 90 90 second um episodes up on itunes and things or on sorry instagram everything so it's it's there it's a whole sop a standard standard operating procedure if you don't know what that is um mm -hmm. to the listeners not you <laughs> you do <laughs> um, so that we do it and then i record the show and and we deploy but one thing i haven't been doing that i used to be doing are those five to ten minute insights and so thank you i always take notes from my i i'm here to learn from my guests so i'm taking notes as well um, we're going to go into a, into a break, everyone, and then we're going to come back and we're going to go into part two. We're going to talk about what does it take to be a professional? We're going to talk about how do you build your brand? And so the guest today is Jeremy Slate. He is an expert in this field and he's going to help all of you grow and scale your business and open your eyes a little bit in terms of what it takes to really do things as a professional. So we will be back after the break. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been another epic episode of the Susan Slot Project. For more tips, strategies, and ideas, visit www.susansly.com. <laughs>